All right, welcome. Today we're going to talk about civil rights as a cap chapter, as a concept, which differs greatly and is more of a continuation from our conversation on civil liberties that we had, both heavily rooted in the idea of the Constitution, what the Constitution says, some specifics about the Constitution. Uh, and so some of the things we're going to look at, we're going to examine just what we mean by what civil rights are, what's a definition we can use, what's a working definition. We're going to look at the ways you can study civil rights. There are a lot of different ways that you can go about tackling this issue. Uh, the two major groups we're going to focus on are civil rights related to African Americans and then civil rights related to the issue of gender. Um, and then we're going to lightly touch on other affected groups in society, including discrimination based on age, disability, sexual orientation, um, being Latino, Native American, uh, Asian American, I believe. And then we're going to close out by looking at some of the more contemporary issues related to this issue. But the first thing we need to do is provide some kind of a definition that we can operate off of, some kind of definition that will help guide us. Um, and of course, depending on which textbook you have, which edition, which authors, which Wikipedia page you've gone to, there are a lot of different definitions of civil rights. Um, for example, one definition that's been provided is the fundamental rights enjoyed by every person person to equal protection under the laws and equal access to society's opportunities and public facilities. Well, what does that all mean? Basically, what we're talking about here are issues of equality under the law. You being treated the same way as the person next to you. You having the same access to society, to that great potential that is the American dream, and more importantly, what responsibility does the government have, and we're talking federal, state, local governments, what responsibility do government entities have to make sure you're treated equally? So if we can talk about civil liberties from last chapter, as being protection from government intrusion, protection from the government getting too involved in your life, civil rights, we're kind of talking about the opposite. We're talking about protection by the government, the responsibility of the government to make sure everyone has, that no one's discriminated against in employment, in hiring, in voting, uh, in where you want to live, what education you receive, so two fundamental differences between civil liberties and civil rights, but this is protection by the government. And there are a lot of ways we can actually talk about civil rights as a concept. We could do it from a historical standpoint, where we can go through and start with um, colonial, the colonial era and the suffrage movement of the 1840s and prohibition and the Civil War and take it up to the Civil Rights Movement with Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Cesar Chavez and Gloria Steinem. That's one way we could talk about the issue. We could talk about it from more of a introspective, sociological, psychological question. We can look at issues of, well, what exactly is racism? Why are, why do people discriminate? We could get into questions of, are there real differences between different groups in society? And is it okay to treat people differently based on those? Those are more internal questions. Those are more mind games where we could ask the question of, are, do you have any prejudicial habits? We're not going to do that. That's not for this government class. We could talk about it from a political standpoint. What is the role of the government in either 
perpetuating, continuing, allowing for discriminatory policies? And what is the role of the government in trying to end those policies? I like that way to talk about it. We'll probably use that way. And then the last way we could talk about equality and civil rights is economical. Is it, it maybe people get discriminated against not for any kind of racist or sexist or any kind of prejudicial reason. It's just because it's in people's economic, economically best interest to do so. So we can look at the money that's involved. We could look at wealth accumulation. We could look at assets versus debts and how race and gender and disability all ties into that. Um, and that's a good conversation. That'd be a great conversation if this was an economics class. But this being intro to U.S. government, what we're going to do is use a bit of the political, a bit of the historical, and we're going to focus on the laws that are related to this, the laws that come out of this. So this isn't going to talk about, well, why do people discriminate? We're not going to look at that. We're going to look at what policies came out of that. Um, so our focus is on the different laws that are passed, at the state and local decisions, how Congress got involved, and one of the key actors here is the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court is ultimately the determiner of what is equal and what isn't equal. What is it within city governments and local governments' power to do, and the Congress's power to do, and what isn't. So. Much of our focus is on amendments, congressional acts, and court cases. Um, for our purposes, the three important amendments to start off with, and we'll add in a few later, are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, what we commonly refer to as the Civil War Amendments, passed within a five-year period following the end of the war between the Confederacy and the Union. Of course, the 13th Amendment is the one we commonly know for having ended slavery. It said that you cannot be, we cannot have any type of slavery in this society, uh, except, interestingly enough, as a punishment for a crime, where that's still upheld. Uh, the 14th Amendment, which is one of our longer amendments, has a few sections. Uh, the One of the sections being most important to our discussion is the first section we say no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abrive the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor to deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. What's so important about that 14th Amendment is that line about due process of law, meaning everyone is treated the same under the law, that everyone has the same rights if you are in a courtroom, and equal protection. Those, so those due process and equal protection are what we would consider the buzzwords. That's what's important to us. And then that 15th Amendment, which says that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So here... We're saying if you are a racial and ethnic minority, you, they cannot stop you from voting on the basis of that, and they cannot stop you from voting on the basis of the fact that you were a slave or an indentured servant. Now, of course, if you note, the 15th Amendment says nothing about sex or gender, so the right to discriminate on the basis of those is still allowed here in 1870. Uh, sorry, ladies, your amendment comes about 50 years afterwards, so we'll get to that amendment. Um, and so the best way to, start this, the way to start this discussion is by focusing in on uh, African Americans uh, and their civil rights struggle, going back to Reconstruction. Of course, after the Civil War ended, when Reconstruction was in full swing, and Reconstruction, of course, was that time where there was military and northern control over the southern former Confederate states. Uh, what Congress tried to do in a brief window was pass a series of laws 
to try to provide equality and some level of social standing to freed black men and women and former slaves. And, and so they tried to create an idea of society through law. Congress passed laws prohibiting the practices of the KKK and other groups bent on terrorism, if you will, or intimidation and threats. They passed laws saying that uh, former slaves could work at their will, could had the right to education, had the right to get married, had the right to any kind of religious freedoms and purpose practices. Uh, and we also saw a large migration of slaves, former slaves, throughout the South and the North. Once they had this mobility, this freedom, they wanted to go something, go somewhere and do something with it. And so one of the important pieces of legislation passed was the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And that date is very important because through the years there have been about a dozen or so Civil Rights Acts. So the date is very important in this one. Well, after Reconstruction ended, after the southern states got their power back, they did begin to pass a series of something we would call black codes, which denied certain freedoms, certain rights to African Americans. Um, for example, Texas had a black code where if you were black, you were free to work, but your work had to be a year-long contract, and you could not leave your contract without punishment. And if the authorities found out you'd quit your job or you'd left your contract, they would capture you, they would arrest you, they would sentence you to going back to that job, except now you'd have to work the job for free. So that's the idea of a black code. For a whole year, you can only do this one job. Uh, we had also had other states have black codes related to curfew, related to um, whether a black person could testify as a witness or serve on a jury if the defendant is a person who was Anglo. And so these are the kind of ways that the South tried to create a caste system. They tried to create layers of society, if you will, with blacks and uh, Asian, a few amount of Asian Americans, uh, Latinos, American Indians, definitely at a bottom tier or a lower rung compared to whites. One significant part of where the Supreme Court comes in is the fact that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was actually struck down as being unconstitutional. In a series of cases we call the Civil Rights Cases of 1883, the Supreme Court said that in fact all Congress could do was legislate the actions and, per, and, and prevent discrimination by governments, cities and states. Congress didn't have the power to stop individuals from discriminating, which means while the city of Mobile couldn't discriminate legally, if you were a private business owner in Mobile, Alabama, you were free to discriminate in hiring, firing, which clientele you choose to serve. So they said, governments can't discriminate, you as a private individual can. So it's up to you to decide how that one, how you want to go. Um, and so the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was actually declared unconstitutional. So this was an attempt by Congress that was struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, and it looks like I'm running out of time. So we'll pick up the second part of this lecture by looking at the case called Plessy v. Ferguson.